not here, so we are having a double. We're back and then tomorrow we go. Try to continue. Yeah, yeah. You try again, and then nothing comes out. Let's try that. I myself find myself extremely vulnerable as a woman, yet I make big work. Shireen Nishant is soft-spoken and reserved, yet determined and ambitious when it comes to her work. In 2017, she was awarded the Premium Imperiale Prize for Lifetime Achievement. She's had numerous exhibitions in Europe and the U.S., made a film about Egyptian diva Um Kuthum, and last year directed a production of Verdi's Aida. We met up with this versatile artist in Salzburg for a conversation about artistic challenges, the country of her birth, and the trauma of exile. When did you visit Iran the last time? The last time was 1996. In the 90s also you started this Women um, of Allah, the photos. So you were dealing with exile, with women, women in Arabic states, in Persia. Are you a feminist artist? This question has been asked for me a lot and uh, and once I asked my audience, do you think I'm a feminist? They all said yes. <laughs> so okay, if you think I'm a feminist, I have no problem. I'm extremely interested in, um, in women uh, in the way that uh, their lives, no matter which country, what culture they come from, and that it's always this uh, duality of being extremely fragile and vulnerable and yet extremely strong and um, defiant. When the Islamic Revolution swept through Iran in 1979, Shirin Neshat was living in the U.S. She didn't return to Iran for another decade. These photos are her response to the country's altered cultural landscape. They're ambiguous. They can be interpreted in many different ways. I remember before my father died, that uh, I was just doing the Woman of Allah photographs, and I, I showed him some of the images, and I said, look, I'm making money with these photographs, and I, am, uh, I have actually a career. People want to show my work, and I travel, I speak about it, and, and, and so I'm not uh, just a designer, I am, because in that time in his life, artists were uh, not considered very serious. And I remember he was so proud, uh, mainly that he didn't expect me to, to succeed uh, as, a, as an individual, as a woman. And he just assumed that I would also like the two sisters would get married, although he really wanted us to get educated. Shireen Nishat had a middle-class upbringing and went to a Catholic boarding school in Tehran. She knew early on that she wanted to be an artist and went to the U.S. to study at age 17. At that time, the Western-backed Shah was still in power. But in 1979, he was overthrown and Islamic fundamentalist Ayatollah Khomeini took over. After that, Shirin Neshat was no longer able to return home. I think those years were the most traumatic years of my life. This separation became really critical for me as a young person who uh, was not quite at ease with the American culture and desperately wanted to go home, but it was impossible because the airports were closed, uh, Iranian and American relationship had broke down, and, and the war uh, with Iraq had become so serious that my family would just say, please don't even think of coming back. Before you know it, you find other people who are in the same situation, and you bond together like I have with my husband and with my colleagues that I work with, and we create our own community as the survivors, and, and we, we made art, and, and, and then you end up creating, pioneering your own lifestyle that is nomadic. The trauma of exile, a changed Iran, gender politics. These are issues she also addresses in her video installations, 
which in 1999 won her the international prize at the Venice Biennale. Contrasts are another recurring theme, men versus women, departure versus arrival. Reality segues into dream sequences. The female experience in Iran preoccupies Shirin Neshat. It was the theme of her first feature film, four completely different women, all seeking to escape their lives. Zarin! Zarin! Es ist ein Freier für dich da! Women Without Men was based on a great novel, a magic realist novel written by uh, one of the most important uh, Iranian women writers who lived in exile. Um, and, and, you know, I've often written poetry in, uh, in my work and my photograph by master poets that are women. Uh, I somehow look up to women, particularly women that come from very oppressive societies, yet are quite empowered. Faisal, let us go. Where do Ich möchte zu Faese gehen. Du gehst nirgends hin. Habe ich dir nicht gesagt, dass wir heute Abend Gäste erwarten? Und ich habe gesagt, ich will sein hässliches Gesicht nicht sehen. Faese, komm jetzt. Du gehst nirgends hin. Ende der Diskussion. Du wirst bald 50. Es dauert nicht mehr lange. Es scheint, du kommst demnächst in die Wechseljahre. Eine Frau kurz vor den Wechseljahren flirtet doch nicht mehr mit irgendwelchen fremden Männern. Sorry, herum. halt deinen Mund. Ich kann deine Anspielungen und Sticheleien nicht mehr ertragen. Welche Sticheleien denn? Die Wahrheit ist doch vielmehr, wenn du mich als meine Frau nicht befriedigen kannst, dann habe ich das Recht, eine andere Frau zu heiraten. Ich glaube, es ist also besser, wenn du... Oh, das reicht endlich! Ich muss dich Tag und Nacht ertragen! Ich muss diesen ständigen Unsinn ertragen! Ich halte das alles nicht mehr aus! Du ekelst mich nur noch an! The film also addresses the U.S.-backed coup against Iran's democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953. Wem gehört diese Villa? Herr Hauptmann, gibt es ein Problem? Ich frage, wem diese Villa gehört. Sie gehört mir. Was möchten Sie denn von mir? Und wo ist Ihr Mann? Herr Hauptmann, sie ist die Frau von General Sadri. Ich verstehe. Women Without Men is Shirin Neshat's most political film. As was the case with all her films, she wasn't able to shoot it in Iran. It won a Silver Lion at the 2009 Venice Film Festival, cementing her rift with her homeland. My work became problematic, and then that was another reason for my separation uh, from the family, and then I think after a few years, this amount of nostalgia, it just overwhelms you and then you reach at a point and say, enough is enough. I can't live forever in this realm of nostalgia and remembrance and this hope of return. After years of processing her relationship to her homeland, Rocha marked a turning point. In my dreams, I always see my mother. And I finally came to the conclusion that this mother figure is not really my mother, it's motherland. This was actually directly my own dream. And when I interpreted it later, I realized that it's my obsession how I'm not really welcomed at any of the given cultures and places. 
I remember, I think it was after 9-11 when I met yes. you and uh, you had problems to come, to go into Spain. You were traveling and it yes. was problematic. Yes. And maybe, or I guess now, how is the situation now under Trump? Well, it's uh, really interesting because uh, the only time that I have experienced racism in the United States was immediately after September 11th, where immediately all Muslims, regardless of where they came from, were targeted. And it, and it was almost immediate. And I, I, I just was dumbfounded because I never seen Americans racist like that. But it didn't last very long. And then came 2016, we had the election. and. It was a complete return to that experience that again happened in 2001. Uh, once again, I, 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 was in, I was shocked by the level of racism that was uh, prompted by you know, th this new administration. But did you have concrete uh, problems? No, no. I do have to say that I have been racially profiled in banks, for example. Every time there's any transaction, uh, they check it and they eventually, I have to call and say, why did that happen? Why didn't I receive the fund or didn't send the money out? They say, oh, uh, do you have anything to do with Iran? And I, I, I realize that uh, it's not the bank, but the way in which uh, the security of the government has now infiltrated in the, in the, the social system. And it's really scary. In 2017, Shirin Neshat made her debut at the Salzburg Festival. In her photographs, in her videos, in her films, I see a great, almost melodramatic quality in her work. And I see a great directorial quality in the photos, which is a galaxy away from being a mere coincidence. Everything is staged. Every shadow and every expression is staged. When Marcus, uh, the director of the festival, invited me to lunch, I had no idea what to anticipate in terms of what he's about to ask me. I imagine he would ask me to collaborate with one of his directors for the festival. But then he announced that he wanted me to be the stage director for AIDA. And, and I, I almost fell over and I said, Marcus, do you realize what you're saying? You're talking to a woman who has never done opera. I don't know anything about Aida and I don't listen to classical music. We had the longest conversation and he said, I have a confidence in you. I know you can do this. And I said, okay, this is going to be your biggest challenge. Now you're going to tackle the biggest opera of Verdi for Salzburg Festival, conducted by Maestro Muti with soprano Anna Nesrovko. Ancient Egypt under the pharaohs. The Egyptian military commander Radames falls in love with Ethiopian slave Aida, but is supposed to marry the pharaoh's daughter. This dramatic love triangle is played out against a backdrop of religious and political divides. For me, what really eventually became very enticing is that the main dynamic in this Aida is about this relationship between these three individuals, the love triangle of Rodimus, Aida, and Amneris, versus the religious fanatics and, and the political figures, the tyranny, the authoritarian government, the king. So it is exactly what I do in all my work. Everything I've done in terms of photography in the film has always been about women in the intersection or the threshold of political tyranny and religious fanaticism. But what I didn't like is how the traditional Aida really is created as the construction of European imagination. It really demonizes the Egyptians and the Ethiopians in a terribly negative way. So what we're trying to do with this interpretation of Aida is to complicate 
cultural backgrounds, cultural ethnicities, and then religious differences and time. Shirin Nishat draws clear parallels with contemporary politics. In Aida, the Ethiopians are the foreigners that society sees itself confronted with. As director, Nishat turns the spotlight on the power exerted by governments and the clergy, past and present. Extraordinary. First of all, I had, for a few years now, I've been gravitating away from Iranian subjects specifically. Uh, as I told you, I felt exhausted by this nostalgia and constantly making work about a country I never visit anymore. So I'd already began this whole uh, process of working in other cultures like Egypt. So I made that film that it has taken me six years now from the beginning of the exploration of the idea to today. Last year, the Venice Film Festival invited Sherin Neshat to screen her newest feature. It's a film within a film about an Iranian director living in exile, looking to make a biopic about the life and legacy of legendary Egyptian singer Umm Kulthum. Your name? Reda Shrif. You speak English? A little bit. So, let's start with you singing one of your favorite Uncle Sum songs, and then we'll have you read some lines. In Egypt, Umm Kulthum was a national treasure, performing for statesmen and monarchs alike, including King Farouk. My question in this film, which is really a story of an Iranian woman trying to tell the story of an iconic Egyptian uh, singer, is when women choose to have an artistic career or any career in a male-dominated society, what do they have to sacrifice? And how do they deal with that? How do they deal with the expectation of a traditional life? And more so, um, as women, how do we serve the public and our pub protect our public image? We remove so many people like she did, where millions of people fell over listening to her music. But what about her? What was it like for her?
She gives a glimpse of what it was like for her when the myth collapses and Um Kulthum's voice fails her. And for the director, who's trying to balance her professional and private life, something that resonates deeply with Shiri Nishant. All the time that I'm making work about other women work or actually inspired by them, they're all women with single child, a boy. And I also have a son. The, the woman who wrote oh, Women Without Men had a son. Furuq Farooq Saad, this incredible poet that I've been using her poetry, had one son. And Umm Kulthum had one adopted son. There's this incredible parallel. And, and that, of course, I, I was not a traditional mother. And she was not a traditional mother. The writer of The Woman Without Men was not a tradition. We were all artists. But somehow we managed. So I find that very fascinating. Both of the German producers were on set the entire time in Vienna and Morocco. They both have experience with Arab subject matter and directors, and of countries with different mentalities. Sometimes you work with artists and think, there's a shocking difference between what's on the screen and the reality of who you are as a person. But that's absolutely not the case with Shireen. Everything goes hand in hand and is of the greatest integrity. She also keeps her word and stands by it, even in difficult times. That's quite impressive at a personal and artistic level. In Venice, the renowned Museo Correa mounted an exhibition of Nishat's photos. The home of my eyes showed portraits of the diverse people of Azerbaijan. You did the show in Venice, the persons of Azerbaijan. You had female, you had men, you had young people, older people, and you did make interviews before with them. What was the topic where and what was remarkably for you when you made the interviews? I was invited to do a commission in Azerbaijan, which once was a part of Iran in the 19th century. So we share a lot of traditions and we were all Zoroastrians. And in fact, many of the people's ancestors in Azerbaijan are Persian or Turks, Armenian, and um, you know, uh, it's multiple ethnicities. So I thought what would be great is to do a project that sort of really questions this idea of homeland for a country that it's a crossroad of so many different type of people from different ethnicities, religions, languages, but they're all called Azerbaijan home. And this was very poignant for someone like myself again, that I had a very problematic relationship to home. I spoke to every one of the, my, my subjects, uh, men, women, young, old, uh, uh, and, and, and really trying to, uh, in very simple way, uh, find out what is the definition home to them. Uh, what is it that signifies and, and gives them that sense of security? What was really amazing uh, answer to so, uh, the majority was that the idea of home is not the big things. It's not the bigger picture of the architecture of the city, but it's small things like the order of your mother's cooking or the first day of spring and the way that you, you feel the smell of the blossoms or the picnic in the fa with the family. It's not about the bigger things. It's just the smallest little things. And I realized that actually for me it's the same. If they would change something in Iran politically, uh, would you like to go back, or is it the chapter in your life which is really over? I have this love for Iranian people, but I feel 
strangely that I, I, I don't know if I want to go back. And now if the door opens, what would happen? Now I would then have to start again uh, as a uh, expatriate now coming back to Iran, starting a new life. I don't think I can start over again. Uh, maybe for a visit, I don't even know. I, I think for the moment, uh, I don't want to go back. Sherin Neshat is constantly looking forward. She's currently working on her next film about Iranian women in the U.S. Changing perspectives helps Shirin Neshat maintain her versatility and curiosity as a person and an artist, a woman looking at the world with open eyes.